Thank you everybody for joining us. I'm so excited to be here today with Kudi and Chike and creative producers Jess Jacobs and Audrey Rosenberg for Soul City. I hope that you just tuned in for the second episode, Pillow Shop. We're gonna be talking about that today. Uh, but before we get into that, let's just do some general introductions. I know that Zoom has a different order on everyone's desktop, so I'll, um, I'll be moderating the chat today, but I'll also just kind of moderate the order that we go in. Um, my name is Xander Shea Brown. I am the Artist Development Coordinator and Programming Manager at the New Orleans Film Society. Um, I'm also a filmmaker myself, and I think part of the reason that the team reached out to see if I was interested is because horror is so my genre, especially Southern-based horror, Southern Gothic horror is definitely my bag. So. I was super excited to um, have the opportunity to moderate this chat today with these really dope creative people and, and you know, have them represent our city like this. So I am going to turn it over first to Kudi to introduce yourself. Hey, what's up, yo? I'm, I'm Kudi, uh, one half of Kudi and Chike, um, part owners of Creative Control with Chike and, and directing team. Uh, born and raised Chicago, Illinois. Um, met Chike because I was documenting Kanye uh, since he was 17. Just knew he was going to, you know, be huge and win Grammys. And uh, they wanted to do a You Here First on on Kanye. And Chike was working at MTV. So that's how I met. And long story short, we got our first video that we worked together um, on was the Through the Wire, Kanye West Through the Wire video. We've been working ever since so that's me peace peace uh, and pk the other half i might as well go from new orleans jackson and daniel third ward um and yeah happy to be here happy to be able to represent the city jess audrey mute you're on mute jess thank you um I'm Jess of, of Jess and Audrey. Um, we are Invisible Pictures, the production company uh, behind Soul City. We developed this piece with Kudi and Chike for about a year and a half um, before we brought Topic on board as a team uh, to, to finish it out. And uh, super, super happy to be here. I'm Audrey of Audrey and Jess and <laughs> Invisible Pictures. Um, I've been producing in New York for creative producing for over 20 years, um, film, TV, docs, and short form, obviously. Um, our company, our mission is um, centered around authentic storytelling and making sure people with lived experience are at the center of their own stories. Um, and we really care deeply about authentic representation. And this project was a perfect example of that. We love working with these guys. We had a, we had a blast. Um, New Orleans has become a second home. I think for Invisible Pictures, we have a lot of feelings about the city and about giving back to the city and making content there. So we're excited to talk about this piece, which we hope is the first of many. Yes, thank you so much. I'm excited to talk about it too. Um, can we just talk about the series first? And I'd really like to get a sense of how all this came to be, you know, how did you find each other, your two um, creative duos, and, and what was sort of the um, train of thought for the creation of Soul City? Well, I'll just start with God first that uh, brought us all together, but you can, y'all can go ahead and, uh, and expand, expand on that. Yeah, well, we met Audrey at this HBO conference. I'm not, I can't remember the, the, the topic of the conference, but it was at a conference, and um, you know, Cootie's usually, he's the social one of, of us two. So he kind of, I was being anti-social in a corner somewhere. And then I see him and he's got like a whole pool of people around him. And then, so then uh, we meet Audrey, but then, you know, we, we just, it was just something about Audrey, just like spiritually we connected and, and we've been cool with Audrey. I mean, at least we were hanging out for probably like a year or so before this, even any of this even came about. And, um, you know, one day Audrey, after about a year of, of just talking, not even about work, just getting up. I think it's always important to just have personal relationships and it's, it's always a blessing when those personal relationships lead to business relationships. 
And um, we were just talking one day and she gave us a call and Raku and I were working on another documentary or just finished up some stuff. And she was like, hey, I, guys, I have this relationship with topics. I mean, do you guys have anything that we could serialize or that we can bring in, in there to them? And first, I mean, it was just like, it was just an honor for her to even, you know, when people covered their relationships. So in a sense, for somebody to be willing to like bring you in somewhere and, 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 and validate and stamp your work because your work now becomes a reflection of who they are and what they're bringing in. So she could have brought in a, a zillion other creatives, but she, she chose us for what she can probably explain why. And then that's where initially where it all kind of started. I'm, ha I'm happy to talk about that for a minute. I think um, similarly to what these guys are saying, I think Jess and I both felt like a kindred, you know, spirit nature with these two guys pretty early on in the relationship. And we were just interested in their work and we were pretty amazed by their work and their body of work even up to that point. And I think what amazed us more is that they hadn't really done as much narrative work, but they clearly had that talent. I mean, there was just no, no, question in our mind. So it became very exciting, both because of the mission of the company. Um, and, you know, Hollywood can be a rough place. So it's, it's interesting to kind of to talk to people as artists and just be together and, and share information and want to give, um, look for opportunities for people to get to do things they don't always get to do. So these guys were very, very motivated to do something in their home cities. And as we started talking, and, I, and Chike in particular was like really turned on by the psychological horror um, and, and, and they both sort of had this, this incredible amount of knowledge of film and, and the other things that had come before the more recent things like Jordan Peele's things, uh, work, which we love, but they had like deep knowledge of, of this universe and what was possible in it. Um, and so I think that just got us talking about, you know, what would be, what would be cool to do and, and how, how could we shape something and, and, and we do have two seasons already in mind, um, but one New Orleans, obviously you've seen three episodes in Chicago and there's something about people in their city and we rarely get to see work where somebody is really authentically showing us aspects of their city because lots of people just write things and they don't really know as much as people who are from there. So it was a, it was a pleasure. I do have to say also Topic was just really a new and exciting place and we're New York producers, we're based in Brooklyn, our company. And so we were very invested also in working with, with a New York studio and kind of seeing what they were about and they have really great taste and they were very excited by this. And so, you know, it, it was, it seemed like a great, a great opportunity and it turned out to be so. And I think also, you know, we see a lot of cities in the US, but New Orleans specifically represented um, as something that's a little bit stereotypical and what Chike really brought to this was a sense of place and was a sense of, of community and that we really, we basically crewed up and almost entirely cast from New Orleans locals. So we really like tapped into the incredible talent in the city and that I think you feel it in the piece. You can just tell that like there's a there's a sense of of who New Orleans is as a character in this, and it was something from the beginning that we knew was important both to Chike, um, to Kuti, eventually for for Chicago, but even just for this first year for this first season, and then um, to Invisible Pictures for exactly the reason that Audrey said around authentic storytelling and around what what it means to actually represent a a city and a culture from within it. That's beautiful. Yeah. And I love what you all kind of said, how you spoke to like this regional focus and New Orleans really breathing life into the series. I don't know if you can hear it right now. It's coming in and out, but this is a very authentic New Orleans Q&A where there's definitely a bounce beat playing outside right now. <laughs> so I've been, I've been on beat whenever I'm not speaking, but maybe that'll add a little flavor to it. I don't know. Maybe I should stay off mute. Um, but I, I, I do want to speak to that, though, because what I, what I saw in these first two episodes, and I saw the third, you know, spoilers, so I really encourage everyone to keep watching, um, but I saw this really rich sense of place and character, um, and that's something that the city is known so well for, and New Orleans has been featured in film over and over again. We kind of get the same, like, camp and kitsch, you know, um, the, the cliches that come with the city and, and something about the, the imagery um, 
the setting, the tone, but also like the characters, the types of people that you'll meet in this city that just really came alive. Um, and so I'm interested, you know, knowing Kudi and Chike that y'all are respectively from New Orleans and Chicago, like I, 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 obviously, I obviously see the um, desire to speak to those cities, but I, I'd, I'd love to hear more about, you know, what it means to have the city that you're from. And maybe, you know, Chike, this is for you to speak to, but for all of you that, have sort of made New Orleans into a home. Um, what it is to have that as a setting for a film and to breathe life into it in a way that only, you know, New Orleans natives can do. I mean, I think, I think it's, it's an amazing opportunity to be able to be in position, to be able to begin to explore stories from your city, stories that you've seen growing up, stories, things that you've witnessed from sitting on your porch and being able and, and knowing and seeing that they haven't been represented yet and being able to have the opportunity to begin to like bring them to the forefront because I feel like just a whole swath of just amazing stories and characters that I know I've seen growing up that I haven't seen represented. And so um, it's just, it was very exciting to have this opportunity and we have so many more that we, you know, it's like a kid in a candy store. We have so many more that we want to bring to life. I feel like we just started, we just grasped this. Even these were like, out of the ones they know, Audrey know, because we've talked about so many different ones. These were just sort of like the ones that were the easiest to sell because, you know, we want to get, we want to really dig deep underneath the rug. You know what I mean? So um, it's just amazing. Like, I'm excited. I'm excited to just show the different versions of, of our culture that exist and, uh, and really branch that open. And I know it exists in every city, but I know New Orleans is, for me, is very like, it's very special because it's very unique. And I didn't really realize how unique and special New Orleans was until I left New Orleans mm -hmm. and then came back home and and being able to really see, um, see the culture, see, see like my block and just see my neighborhood and see from with a different lens on from having traveled now different places. Yeah, it, was, it was it was amazing too just to just to come down to New Orleans because all all I knew about New Orleans was uh, girls going wild and the Mardi Gras and all of that you know the the, the infomercials that's all I really knew about it and then then to come down and, and really experience the culture I remember the first time I came it was a second line going on and I was like and they had this coffin in the air and they was just doing this thing with the car like, and they dancing and I'm like, wait a minute, it's a funeral or a party. I, I like who's in the coffin, but just, just those things. I, I was amazed. And, and then to do the project down there and to be down there for over three months was man, it was the best time ever. Awesome. Oh yeah. I mean, it's definitely, definitely a place of celebration and grief and all kinds of things, but it gives me so much joy. It's, to see other people recognize that for the first time. Um, Jess and Audrey, did you, did you all wanna to speak to that? I mean, the only thing I think I would add um, has to do with like every layer of storytelling is significant for a piece. So from development through to post, which we did all of production and all of post in New Orleans, which was amazing. Um, and I know a lot of people some, you know, will leave for post and this and that, and we didn't. And, you know, I'm glad we didn't. And I think it would be unfair not to also recognize the, the environment of the city. It's really like no other city. So I'm not sure I can put into words what it is about New Orleans, other than it's full of possibilities at all times, every day. And also that people who are gravitate to that city, and I'm a New Yorker, so there's a similarity to me, but it's not, not in the cities, but maybe in the, in the, in the uh, courage and in the kind of like zest for life, I think that people have. Um, and our crew and, and our, our cast, as Jess was saying before, I mean, we, we worked with um, incredible people who are, who are New Orleans, they're all from New Orleans, they all live there, they're all invested in their city, you know, they're, they're true professionals, they know what they're doing. And, you know, we loved, we loved every day of working with them. We loved every day and, and working with our writer, Renzo, you know, I think for Jess and I, and I'll, I'll, I'll speak for both of us, like it was a wonderful, like, ex, you know, experience of also just like having an open mind and really allowing people to tell their own stories and learn, listen and learn and not make assumptions and understand when you are making an assumption or you're coming from a different background or culture and you don't know. That's the thing. 
Like, you know what Hollywood tells you, you know, which hopefully we're changing to some degree, you know, and there's wonderful work being made in Hollywood. But what I'm saying is from a representation standpoint, we haven't even scratched the surface on these rich cultures and, and on people and how people really are. So we're trying to bring that to people because it's important. But in the process, I think for Invisible Pictures too, because it's so important for us to listen and to learn and to be able to make space for other people to tell their stories. They don't need us to always tell you anything. You know, we, it was a complete privilege to, to be able to be part of it and, and then to, to be swept up in the energy of it. Well, and I think that that's why it's so exciting to be able to be talking with you, um, Zandashe, like through the, the New Orleans Film Society, because like this is the community of people that we really felt that we were ingratiated into, that it wasn't something that we felt entitled to. We walked in like super humble and said like, we have to learn. And like that opportunity was just super, super cool. Um, and then, you know, given that everybody just watched Pillow Shop, you know, I think that as a team, that was the one that we were sort of like, okay, it's the least New Orleans specific as far as how it was constructed. She can could always say like, you know, that was one that could have kind of been dropped into different places, except that then when you think about it, uh, what it is to be sort of walking in as an outsider to New Orleans, and then also the statistic um, of the number of Black men that are unemployed in New Orleans right now, and to see what um, Andrew is going through trying to find a job and how desperate he is, like there actually is a connection to the place, and that just comes super authentically out of the people who created it, and that there is a connection to like what's happening on the ground, even when it isn't super explicit, like this is, you know, we're dealing with like some of the black magic, some of the sort of underbelly stuff. It's like, no, this is just sort of the day to day for so many people. And in an episode like Pillow Shop that might not feel on the nose, like it's connected to New Orleans, there actually is so much that in its depth has, has like a real nod to the, like the issues and also just the place and the people um, and the beauty of the city that that does welcome newcomers and like, I mean, like Audrey and I and like Cootie. Absolutely, I definitely see that. Um, well, yeah, to that point, let's, let's, let's talk about Pillow Shop, which I so enjoyed. I hope everyone watching is, is following, you know, from that episode. And I wanna talk about our favorite moments, you know, so I'm going to ask that question of you, whether that's, you know, how it came out in the film or favorite moments on set or any stories behind production. I'm just curious about that. But um, I love suspense building and there's, you know, there's layers of story happening in this episode between um, the main character whose name I'm forgetting, but, um, you know, his relationship between Oh, say it again. Andrew. Andrew. Andrew's relationship with his wife, who doesn't seem to have enough time for him, and you know him seeking this like escape and not being able to go to sleep, um, and so he gets this pillow from the pillow shop, which is you know the the kind of stuff that you would expect to find in in the French Quarter or some nook or cranny somewhere like that. Um, and so we see in this episode how what what he's been escaping to in that sleep and the moment that his wife laid down on that pillow as well <laughs> that suspense just rose for me so much because i was just you know not only was i um anxious about her safety and this clearly doesn't look like a safe space for anyone. There's something threatening here, but I was also anxious about, well, what is she going to see? <laughs> what is she going to find when she gets there? And so I just thought that's so, um, that's such a great way to weave together those, those types of uh, themes and stories kind of into one. Um, but I, but I want to hear from you guys, like in, in any order, you know, what were some of the most valuable moments in that episode for you? I think I think for for Cootie and I, especially for Pillow Shop, it was just the process of actually getting that made because that was a story that we had been sitting on for so long. I mean, we developed that story back in probably like 2007 in LA. Like I had a dream. It was a straight dream. And I woke up like it was five in the morning. And I like, woke Cootie up. I'm like, Joe, I had this dream. Like we got to, we got to, I told him a dream. And then we just started writing the story. 
together to the point to where like we had even developed a whole like um we wrote a whole story out for it, like a short story so we wrote it into like this actual story which is like a little as wow. much as I can get you can even see like the guy in the background and it's so close because the character we cast it almost feels like that character yeah. we wrote this whole this yeah. whole story out for it and um so to be able just to kind of to see that come to life you know and there's so many like even though there's been various iterations from like what we've incepted to what is on the screen you know because that was constructed to be like a feature length film at one time somebody can, we had it written somebody wrote a, a theatrical i mean a, a, a feature narrative and based it in like the scottish yard or the london yard or something in 1800s yeah. so to see it like it go through all these different versions but to see it still um be able to maintain the core and 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 of the storytelling no matter like how we frame it so then to frame it in new orleans because I still feel the essence of it was still, it was always this villa and this villa always felt magical, like one of these courtyards that you would find in New Orleans. So to be able to still have all these elements and be able to wrap it around the city was, all, was awesome to see that come to life. That's awesome. How about, uh, how about you, Kuti? Audrey, Jess, what are some favorite moments or just background stories? I mean, it was some, it was some definitely some challenging favorite moments, like, um, you know, and that, I think really is just like mm. the things that were happening, like everything was just happening. It was like, we wanted this, we couldn't get it. So Audrey and I would find something even better for, for the budget that we, it was just like, everything was just happening the right way, you know? So that, that was the magic that was happening. And, you know, I think it came a lot from, for, cause we prayed before every um, shoot and, and God was just making magic happen. And it was just amazing to see. Uh, we had one day to shoot this hotel, uh, the whole dream sequence in, in Pillow Shop. And we all was like, how are we gonna do this? And it just flowed, it just flowed. And uh, and with that, that was one of my favorite challenging parts. I was going to speak to the uh, the villa actually, because there were a couple of different layers of that piece, which were which was that Kudi and Chike had a really specific vision for what they wanted for that place. So I think that that is probably the location that we scouted like the the most options for. I think we probably saw like six or seven places. Um, or maybe our locations people showed us six or seven places and we ended up scouting the five. But anyway, we were, we were all over the place for that. And when we found the one that we ended up at, it was like, it was perfect. We were so happy. Um, however, they only had one day for us. And so we were like, okay, great. We're shooting maybe half the episode, it feels like, in one day. Cool. Um, we had, I think, the most characters, the most extras in that day. Um, there, we had to like re-wallpaper a bunch of it because if you, you'll, if, when you watch it, you'll notice that like there's a certain pattern that occurs in all of the episodes, like a couple of things that our production designer sort of threw in there as like little fun bits. Um, but so it was like setting the whole place up, shooting everything, breaking it all down. I think that it ended up being, as far as a shoot day, like a 15 or 16 hour shoot day, which is obviously bananas. Um, and everybody got paid for it and all that stuff. Like it was all kosher, but it was just a really long day um, for us uh, that day. And also completely magical because at some point you were like, great, we have to lean into it. Like we got to get the shot. We got to do it in one take. Like we'll make it happen. And all of our actors, Dorian and Tadase and Peter, everybody, they were just so wonderful to work with. Um, and really, yeah, made it happen. Like, like Kudi said, thanks to everybody upstairs, thanks to God and everybody, um, and, uh, and to our entire crew and cast, just completely magical, the teamwork. And, and not to mention too, that Jess was acting and producing at, on that one. So y'all was scared there. A little sneaky. And I, wanted to, I wanted to say one thing about Dorian because um, he's an actor, Dorian Missick, who's just wonderful. He's on For Life on ABC right now, among other things I'm sure most people have seen his work. And he's a very, very old friend of mine. I think I've known Dorian for over 20 something years. And when we were talking about Pillow Shop, because there was this wonderful tone, Pillow Shop had this different tone and this quirky tone in this way. And like, we were talking about who this guy was, Andrew, you know, and I, and I just, 
I don't remember Chike exactly, but I think I was like, what do you think of Dorian Missick? And then Chike could not get Dorian out of his head. Like he, he really is Andrew. And we had so many fun laughs about, about that because he has this terrific face and, and way about him. And he's just has oozes talent, but he also was literally perfect for it. So, so it was so much fun to be able to get him to do it. And, and he was, he was a pleasure to work with as were the other actors. Um, yeah, and everybody covered a lot. That day was rough, but but I think it showed us at least the of us and the crew that we can do any almost anything. Well, I think we learned so much too from from that, especially for us as being like not only first time uh, narrative. This is our, being our first time directing a narrative piece, but also in the framework of like abiding to like union rules and stuff like that. So it's like you write when initially in, when you're writing this stuff, that's the last thing you're thinking about. And so initially we had written this whole elaborate piece to have taken place in this villa, sort of like imagine just any of the villas like in the French Quarter. And we had, we would have, we had where um, where Andrew's wife finds herself in the in the back of the villa by a ladder, this ladder that goes all the way up, kind of like Rapunzel, but like a twisted backwards version of Rapunzel, where like Rapunzel's now not in the castle but on the ground, right? And so. Um, and I, we never thought, so we were trying to figure out this and, and we were fighting like Audrey and Jess, God bless, were fighting nail and tooth to really get us this villa. But then then Audrey's like, but you know you're gonna need like a stunt person to play. And I'm like, what? I'm like, yeah, like she has to climb up a ladder. Like <laughs> you you just can't have your actor climb up a ladder. Like, and I'm like, in the these air. Are things that I'm not like, oh, I never thought about that. <laughs> I didn't think about that. I'm thinking, okay, because they actually, actually, has to fall from the ladder too. So we need a scene where she has to fall into like a green bag, like a green screen to fall. But it's like, that's a, that's a stunt. And a stunt person's another high. So it's like being able to like, have to calculate, you know, production needs versus creative needs. And that's the first time I think we've ever had to deal with that versus in narrative. We've all, we, in docs it's easier because you can, you can find your way around it easier. But in this, we had to quickly like creatively respond in a way. I think I'd like to hear a bit more about um, your journey, Kudin Chike, into narrative. Um, because you have such, you know, an impressive resume with all of your work. I was looking at some of the music videos you guys have done before, and I was like, this is incredible. But what, what's the most um, surprising thing, or I don't know, challenging thing? Like, what's the most significant difference that you've noticed in moving the narrative? And before you answer that, I want to say, anyone watching right now, please feel free to um, enter your questions in on the chat on Eventive, and I will bring them to our panel soon after I get all my questions out. <laughs> well, I, I, I can say, well, it's, it's like you always, as, because um, we just, you know, we storytellers, so you always have to prove yourself. We did, uh, through the wide video, it was number one. And then we went, you know, we thought we was going, going to do a, a movie. We went out to L.A. Uh, and signed with Charles King and William Morris. And he was, you know, sending us out. But we was always considered first time directors. But we had a lot of number one videos. And mm -hmm. so we were like, OK. And then we just focused on like really working on our craft, which led us to documentaries. When, and when we did the ESPN 30 for 30 Benji, that was our first long form. So then we like, okay, now we good. We did a long form. So now we can go to the next level. Not, nope. We we'll pitch again for things, first time directors. They give it to somebody else. But we knew what we can do. So thank God that, that we met Jess and Audrey who believed in us to to work with us to make this, you know, this series happen. So so we can show, you know, that we that we are storytellers. We're not you know, we're not video music video directors or documentary directors. We're, we're storytellers, we're filmmakers. Yeah. And I think on top of that too, is like even being honest with yourself and like as we embark on this journey again, like I feel like we have an innate talent to tell story, but then that doesn't mean that you can tell the best stories because you instinctively know how to tell a story. So like in the process of, of getting in, into starting to like help with really work on the development of these stories and begin to start writing these. And even far after writing these, like starting to dig more because now we're really interested and want to do more narratives and then really realizing like, I thought I know, but I really didn't know. Like there's so much more to like 
on top of on top of like instinctively having a talent to do something really been able to now cultivate that talent and actually know how to control it and know what you're really doing because a lot of storytelling has to deal with understanding the history of storytelling and how to really tell a story um, and hit beats based upon just understanding it from the beginning times of since stories been created and performed, you know? Yeah, that's great. Um, well, I think I have one more question before I spin things over to some of our questions in the audience. Um, watching Pillow Shop, you know, Twilight Zone comes to mind. Uh, and with the series overall, just, you know, a, a good horror anthology or um, sci-fi anthology, that, that's kind of like the, the, the basis in a lot of ways. But I'm curious, what are, what are some other things that influenced all of you for Soul City? I mean, definitely Amazing Stories was a huge inspiration because of the way it, it, how it's classified as horror and how it handles horror. It's not necessarily like creepy or horrific type of horror that's going to have you with, in nightmares. It's more the type of horror that just deals with a lot of psychology and offers a lesson at the end of the piece and just makes you think deeply. My, my mother, like that's the one thing we could, she would like let me stay up for when, when I was in school was, was uh, always like Tales from the Dark Side or like these like Amazing Stories. So like we just, to this day, we still try to outhang each other and watch those types of projects. But each each individual story, I think, had different inspirations to us. Like um, in Grace, like Killer Sheep, Charles Burnett's Killer Sheep was a huge inspiration as far as the black and white and how he like was able to portray like the era and even some of the, uh, like even some of the um, photography work, Gordon Parks really inspired like, you know, how we were trying to capture like a lot of the soul in some of those frames. So, um, Wow. You know, we found inspiration even particularly on each individual piece. It's the reason why they kind of stylistically are also a little bit different from, from one another. Nosferatu, as far as like how we handled some of the shadow work, was definitely a huge inspiration um, within how we carried the character of Expedite. So. Mm. And, I, uh, and um, Get Out was perfect. Get Out coming out at that time was perfect timing for what we were thinking and, and doing. You know, that was an amazing thing that Jordan Peele did that definitely inspired uh, us to move forward quicker with what we, our thoughts, you know. And I think it's really interesting to sort of jump off of what Kudi just said, like when you have Get Out come out and be as successful as it was, it also helps sort of show people that might not have otherwise seen this as a possibility to see that it really is possible, that there really is room for genre to say something super interesting about race, about, about people, about gender, about all of these different things. And I know that like, I'm saying this as a white woman, but like the opportunity to sort of say like, there doesn't need to be one black man telling stories through genre about it, it, racial experience. Like there's opportunity for a plethora of stories. And, and all sorts of different stuff. And so like when this opportunity came up, I think that Topic really saw, they're, they're so visionary in so much of what they do already. But I think the fact that they get out had just come out to what Kudi said, like there, there was room to sort of say like, okay, wow, like there's a hunger for this. There's, a, there's like a real appetite out here. And then, and then for us at Invisible to also say like, great, and it shouldn't just be Monkey Paw that is doing this. There should be all sorts of different folks Monkey Paws, Jordan Peele's company for anybody that doesn't know, um, that there should be all sorts of different people from different spaces and different like cities um, telling their stories through this genre to really illuminate what's, what's happening and what's out there. I also just wanted to say something about cinema in general, because mm -hmm. I'm remembering a lot of conversations that we had and storyboarding and you know, these guys like educate themselves, they've educated themselves, they are filmmakers. They know a lot and they're influenced by cinema and cinema matters. I know we're in a new phase of life and things are on phones and other places, but like Chike and Kudi had had so many things to draw from and they're extremely visual. Now, Jess and I also are absolute lovers of, of cinema and, and of storytelling in general and what media can do. But it was, it was like our, our DP, Josh Bagnall. I mean, he, he, he just, he, worked himself to the bone 
within our budget and our schedule to try to give us, you know, as much as we can in collaboration, the kind of looks we wanted and shots we wanted. And these guys are extremely meticulous about that. And all I can say is we're super proud of it. And if you give these guys more money to do something and like more time and more whatever, which I'm not complaining, you have no idea, you know, what, what the contribution could be, you know, and I'm looking forward to it cause I'm gonna go get that money, but I'm just for these guys yeah. and, and whatever, but mm -hmm. I'm just saying like, you know, it's it, budget matters and time matters and it's all a gift. Like this was the most incredible experience. Um, and, and we did a lot, we did a lot, you know, with what we had, but it, it really did come from like a lot of knowledge, a lot of vision, and and be and allowing oneself to be influenced by things that came before us. So you know, Twilight Zone, Tales from the Crypt. You know, what did we used to watch at night? And in, and a lot of conversations about loving horror, but in some ways, like maybe the four of us leaning a little more into like the psychological aspect to it, the spiritual aspect to it. What what pulls somebody to the dark side? What makes these energies exist among other energies? Um, what happens to people and it's like based in humanity that might have them behave a certain way or be misguided from history from tr their own treatment what what are the things so we hope that those questions are are happening for people when they're watching that there's a depth and one of the things i have to say that i love the most about these guys is there's a subtlety to their work also they really don't bang you over the head. We had some arguments here and there about yes. when developing scripts and, and that's really healthy. I say that because creative conflict is very important between collaborators. You have to be able to get in there and say like, I agree, I disagree, why, why? And be able to change each other. And we, we did that a lot. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it, it has to live and breathe and, and it, and it come, I hope it comes through, um, even in, in some of the subtlety and from what we're hearing, it does. So I, I think that's, that's exciting and not gory. I mean, we just chose not to go in that direction, so. I mean, I could talk for hours about, you know, what, what the horror genre has the possibility to do, especially when it's being told from the perspectives of marginalized people who have had really horrific experiences. This is just such a, plethora of stories there and so i love to see it you know handled with grace not to uh, you know uh, <laughs> <the first episode. laughs> with grace and with you know that that subtlety and um to kind of like respect its audiences and so that was just something that i really enjoyed watching was like this has something to say and it trusts that i can hear it you know i can pick up on those things and and, and make those um, assumptions for myself around what I feel. And yeah, so kudos to you guys. Um, well, I am going to go ahead and open up to the audience with some of their questions. Um, so please feel free to keep sending questions through as we get through these first few. Um, first, we have from Christy Connor, she asked, what was the biggest challenge in this whole process for, for any of you or for all of you? Getting the green lit first, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> first, but go. I'll, I'll take it. I feel the biggest challenge is, 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 is execution. It's like at the time now when everything is green lit, you have your scripts, you know what you want to shoot. Now you arrived in the city and now you're trying to back everything into your vision. And then, you know, things change at that moment. So like being able to try to figure out, get the best representation of what you initially have. And it takes a whole team of people to see that through. And I, th I think the beauty of shooting in New Orleans is like, at least with our crew, everybody cared from every part, every aspect of this, every end of production, you know, people really, really pushed themselves to, to, to give us um, what we were looking for. And I think everybody can probably walk away owning a piece of this because, um, you know, I, it wasn't like we, they just pushed for us. I believe we all pushed for ourselves. I think we, we tried to create a space where everybody can, can leverage this project in some way for themselves, you know? And I just remember like every, every aspect from, from Matt and props and Bradley and color, and Ryan, our editor, like 
the gal and art like i mean mooks in the uh trying to locate these these actual productions because you build these sets in your mind but you're not in new orleans and so that you have you're trying to match them up and it's like people just like the crew just really like it was an it was an amazing crew man mm-hmm. every single aspect of our crew yeah I, I would say also because I want to acknowledge uh, Elsa Kern, who was a producer oh, man. with us, and she was, our, she was our line producer slash producer, well earned producer credit. Um, and they they have something called Fish Pop Studios in uh, New Orleans. If you don't if you don't know it, you should. Um, oh, and I think like without having a partnership with someone like Elsa on the ground, who knows born and raised New Orleans really brilliant like yeah. producer and like knows the stuff and is fully in and fully committed you know we were still running a company we started the company in 2017 so one of the challenges is also juggling you know we had a film in post-production Cootie and she you know <laughs> just yeah. we had we had a lot going on and i know we we i hope everyone feels we did stay focused we were 100 percent in because that's how we are and we'll work overtime to do it but i would say like for the budget and making it work and figuring it all out. Like we had to have those partners that knew the city and knew how to make the money go. There's music videos that get shot that are four minutes long that get shot for what we shot three episodes. So like if we don't have that, yeah, if we don't have that crew that we have, if Elsa's not really pushing that, like she's pushing it, like it doesn't, it really just doesn't get done. People are are, are having like, you know, they're taking Grace Force we're, we're pulling nights, like it, it's a lot. And, and it was just really, everybody was, it was a blessing just to have the, the team that we, I can't stress that any more, you know what and I mean? The actors and like the same yeah. thing in post, like Matt Colby, who like, I just wouldn't let him say no to doing our mix. And he's just yeah. an incredible sound guy. Bradley saved us. I mm-hmm. mean, Bradley. Kyoto Color, they're just amazing. So, and I wish we could name everybody and you can look in the credits. So please slow the credits down and credits look at everything. Credits were great. I enjoyed oh, seeing nice. so many names I knew in the credits. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. so special. There's actually this funny thing, just, I mean, I could, I like ditto everything that everybody said, our crew, our cast, the green light process, running a company while it's happening. Production in and of itself is a, is a, is a beast. So like all that stuff is super true. There's like two two things, one story and one just sort of funny little tidbit. The tidbit is that um, outside of pillow shop, outside of the pillow shop, like when it's all boarded up, there's kind of like a houseless person that is lying on the on the side of the building, and uh, that person mm-hmm. is um, is our our uh, production designer who had probably not slept from the beginning of production until he lied down in the middle of our set and took yeah. a nap. As a as an extra, <laughs> it's <how you> can. <laughs> so it was so he was just like he was ready he was out, um and he really like that the Jesus um, sculpture that is in Grace he sculpted that by hand. This man is an absolute genius. Matt. It's just like a genius, and so um and then the other sort of thing I think just to sort of share a fun story is our, it's in the, it's in the third episode. So you have to watch it to know exactly what I'm talking about. But our final day of shooting, we were um, building this sort of like, uh, you have to tell me exactly what the right word is for it, Chike, but it's kind of like a seance. It's sort of like a, like a ceremony. Yeah. And um, we were, we were building it and we built it in the, in the courtyard of a church. Um, not of a church, of a hotel. And there was um, open space above, but there was like a little covered space where we could make sure that we housed all the equipment and everything in case there was any weather, et cetera. But it was at a hotel. So all the actors had rooms, the costume department had a room, et cetera. So everything was all sort of apart. And about midway through the night, and it was an overnight shoot, our last night. And midway through the shoot, like sort of, stuff started kind of going a little bit weird. It was like, we were doing all this shadow work. And so they'd set up the... Um, the lights and we had our our puppeteer um, Jacques who was doing the shadow work and then before being told to they had so, sort of decided to move the light they thought that they had gotten that cue and they had it and whatever and the, the light drops and breaks and we're like shit there's still other shadow work to do like okay great we fi- we totally figured it out again like a testament to how incredible this crew yeah, was and everything right. like badass so they, they got that back up together we're like okay great we have Omar Dorsey's in his dressing room he leaves a bunch of the costumes were in there. So he had been in there with it. He leaves, goes to do something else and comes back to his room and the door won't open. We're like, what? The door won't open. 
we put the key in, we're like, the door, the lock had like somehow jiggered out a little bit so that it was like, we had the key outside. It just like wasn't opening. We're like, oh my God, it is like two in the morning. Are we gonna have to call somebody to come and take the door off this room? Like all of the costumes are in there. Our costume designer is freaking out. She's like, am I gonna have to go get new costumes? Like, what are we gonna do? All of Omar's stuff is in there. All this stuff is freaking out. There's just like this. And then in the middle of the night, it starts raining. So we're like, okay, great. We have pyrotechnics. There's a bunch of fire in that space. We're like, okay, great. Move all the gas and all the fire out of the, out of the rain. Okay, great. We'll move it. Oh no, it's raining again. Move it back out. Okay, great. You can move it back in. And it was just like this sort of crazy moment where I think the four of us looked at each other at one point and we were like, the spirits are alive in New okay. Orleans, man. We are recreating a spiritual convening and they're pissed. Mm -hmm. They're mad at us. And so we, we, we dealt with the brunt of that a little bit in New Orleans. And so that for me was one of our most challenging, one of our most challenging moments was just like, okay, you can't fight the spirits. You gotta just go with it and roll with the punches and make it happen. And I think that the scenes turn out beautifully. Y'all have to watch the third episode and let us know what you think, but. Oh yeah. One, one, one more quick story is uh is when we were shooting at the church and um it was a lightning storm. Oh, wow, yeah. You know, it was a lightning storm. So you know we had to shut everything down to the point where we like, okay, well we not gonna be able to you know, we budgeted to the day, you know, so this day is the budget and we gotta do this this day. So it was a big deal. Like we couldn't work because of that. You know, they couldn't bring in equipment. Or nothing. So we shut everything down. We like, okay, we gonna might have to go home, but we what are we gonna do? And then we was like, well, we might as well pray now before <laughs> you know before you know. We usually pray right before we take take the first shot. We like we might as well pray now. And we pray. And I'm talking about sky cleared up. We got everything. It was insane how that happened. That sounds like such a New Orleans production, such a Louisiana production. I mean, I have stories like that myself. I know yeah. a lot of people at work out here who have stories like that. And it is just, it's one of those moments where it's like, all right, let's press pause yeah. and <laughs> come back I, to I, I just want to say one thing is in case there's any producers in the audience or people that want to be producers, those are the moments where you're tested the most, yeah. where you're honestly, the buck stops with you. You have a crew that you have to be in charge of and, they, and you cast and, and directors and people that you're responsible for. We had extras that day more than usual. Um, and we obviously were following the rules. On both of those days, actually. Yes, if there was lightning, you had to wait a certain amount of time. And, and we did all of that, of course, to be safe. But there, was a, there is a moment where you have to know how to make a call. And you have to stand behind your decision and you have to, you're not always gonna be right. But I think when you when you really like take in all of the elements and you become somebody who can make that call, then you know you're a producer because that's your job. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's your job. I'm I'm gonna move us to the next question. This is from Fallon Young, and she asks, Kudi and Chike, can you expound upon your creative relationship as co-directors? Does one of you have a strength the other doesn't have in the partnership? And how do you think working with the other one makes the work stronger? So whichever two, two, two heads are always better than one, and they're, and they're definitely a whole group of people, definitely stronger than one person or two people. But you know, Chica, you could explain. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it works best right for me because we both, we definitely both, um, as much as we are alike, we're different, and so we're different in personality, and I think we're different in just the way we've we've arrived to film. So our backgrounds are different. So um, my strengths are like. I went to art school, so my strengths are more um, are about art direction. I'm more in, interested in the cinematography and, and how the those aspects of the visual aspects are telling the story. And Kudi, Kudi comes from a background of actually being in front of the camera. Kudi was a professional comedian. Mm -hmm. um, and so he, and obviously comedy, the, the, when you're on stage and you're rocking a house of 3,000 people, like it's all about your time and it's all about beats, hitting these beats. And, um, you know, narrative is all about moving your story beats forward. So like you have to be very cognizant of all the beats that you're trying to hit. So Cootie's amazing in the edit and amazing with storytelling in general. So I feel like they are, we can focus on different aspects of the filmmaking process, narrow in on them. So it, it makes things move a lot faster because if we're on set, we can totally be in two different places at one time and getting things done. So I think our sets run extra smooth because of that. There isn't that much of like, we haven't experienced at least yet in all the productions we've been on 
too much like even amidst any disaster there's pretty much a sense of like going with the flow because we know things are getting taken care of because I think it's not like one of us that's t in taking all the pressure so we feel like well I know Cootie's over there handling that I'm over here things are getting handled so we're good so we definitely have our strengths and uh and you know we both are, are confident in one another to the point where you know Cootie's capable of, of, of doing the whole thing by himself and, and I'm capable of doing the whole thing by myself. But when we work together, there's something more magical and it's better. You know what I mean? And we're both ego -led. Ego, we have no ego. We work on that to have no ego. And so we take criticism well. We're able to criticize each other with no, without an ego. And so I think uh, there isn't something that we're looking when we do it, uh, when we work on a project, we're not, we're not caring about like, who's Jordan at night because we all in a team it's like different people have to show up every night and it's not about uh who played who has the best game it's about getting the, that W and yeah. so like you know if, if Cootie got to show up as Jordan then I'll be Pippin you know what I'm saying and, <laughs> and vice versa just we're trying to win the chip and that's all that matters so we play to our strengths to win the championship and, and we got the best best coach you know uh we always say that that Jesus is direct you know so with that, we both spiritual and then with that faith, it's like, you, you don't, it's, it's almost like you don't have, I used to worry like when we about to do a music video and I'd be like worried about things. What if this happened? What if that happened? And then with that faith, everything is going to happen the right way, even if it's not the right way that you think. Like I remember when we were shooting this video for Pac Div and it was raining and most of it was raining and we needed a sunny day. But when the rain kind of cleared up, the sky that we got was better than what we even can imagine, you know? So it was like, God did that, <laughs> you know, Jesus did that. So that's, that's definitely helps with, uh, you know, when you have that type of faith is, is insane, the magic that happens. And, and I know that Audrey and I talk a lot about how incredible these guys partnership is. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna pop in and say, neither of us have ever seen a duo that works together like these guys work together. The, the, the mutual respect and trust and appreciation for, for the artistry and what the two of them bring to the table. It's just super inspiring. And it's, it's an incredible thing to get to work with. So we were super lucky. Oh, thank you, Jess. Yeah. <laughs> Our next question is coming from Miguel Asala, and he asks, Miguel's a beast. Where? Yeah. He's on our crew. I'm glad he brought up this question because um, I, because I, I had the same thing in my head, but wanted to spend time with Pillow, Pillow, uh, Pillow Shop. He asks, where did the idea for Grace come from? Oh, so Grace, so Grace came from, uh, we were just rummaging through the internet one day, and, and there were these images in Hong Kong of some of the living conditions of people like um, living in these really like these small cubicles. And so, matter of fact, I can show you. Oh man, you have the shot. So it was like these little cramped spaces. And so it was just imagining like what would happen if like somebody got stuck there for like ever, ever, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And we actually, it, it, it was, it was a, a, a short, a 15 second inspired off of a 15 second short that we actually did for Facebook. Um, and we just built it out. But the 15 second short was this animated short, but dealt with this, this lady that was confined in this old lady that was confined in this space. So then we just built that out into a, a bigger piece. But um, the initial inspiration came from a photograph. And I think we work a lot like that, like definitely very visually inspired when by anything in this anything like that you that we see it's it's we observe a lot and so everything's pretty much fair game but um photography is has is, been definitely a huge source of, of inspiration for us that's awesome you can definitely see that um photography was a really big source of inspiration and i, I love that you were speaking to gordon parks to um killer yeah. pete for that first episode and i i see that so clearly um, another question from Micah Haley, how did you approach plans for distribution? I mean, I, I can answer that. I, I think we were, we were lucky enough to have it all in one because Topic is both a studio and they were also going to be the distributor because they now have an SVOD of their own um, that 
is where you're able to see Soul City. So the so the studio that financed the project is also the the um, platform. And, and and Audrey mentioned earlier, they're a New York based studio, which, you know, there's a lot of studios that are based in LA and it's super wonderful. We all, all four of us travel there all the time. Um, but to really be able to work within New York for the four of us who are all New York based and then to obviously go down to NOLA um, to shoot and, and post there, there was a really cool opportunity to, to do something that felt like it was in our hometown um, and then to bring it down to Chike's hometown. Uh, and bring it home. And they, it was interesting because they were a dot com when we first met with them. So they had a website that was topic.com um, that was sort of like a blog. It was, it was a combo of like journalism and videos and like a bunch of sort of other stuff. And they were sort of month by month themes that they were doing. And so we had, you know, pitched it to them th for, for that platform. And then as we were working with them, they developed this SVOD and, and launched it. And so we ended up being original content with them. And so it was also really a special experience to get to grow with topic um, and one that felt super intimate and, and really unique. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think I have another question for you guys too, actually, what, because the, you know, we have these two uh, partnerships, these two creative partnerships here to people who are looking to find what you have, Justin Audrey, what you have, Kuri and Chike, what advice would you give for them in, in finding like that person that you work well with creatively? I don't think you can find them. I yeah. think they come to you. You know what I mean? I think you have to align yourself with your passion and your purpose and sit in that and then really go along for the journey, but be open to your blessings. Don't, don't, like I always say like, don't look at life as a noun, look at it more as an adjective. And I'm saying that to say like, wherever you're trying to go, don't have a concrete vision of exactly how it's gonna look, more like align that with an intention that's back behind like an emotion. Maybe it's, I wanna make impact and I wanna be happy. And then follow that and everything else will go and flow around you. You'll meet the people that you need. You'll, you'll meet your tribe, you'll walk and you'll know it as soon as you see it. Like you'll know, like when I met Cootie for the first time, I didn't, I had no clue that we would ever work together. Kui and I kicked it and hung out in the streets of New York for like um, for a year and a half before we even talked about working together. You know, I didn't know that that was my person until he was became my person. I didn't know Audrey. You know, we we kicked it together um, for a year before we even talked about working on anything together. You know what I mean? So which was even dope because you build such more of a trust behind that that person. You know, um, and then she's partnered with Jess and. And even Jess has helped us with other projects through her relationships because um, we've been doing stuff in, in, in basketball. And it's like, you're not thinking about that. That's even going to be an opportunity that happens until it happens. So I feel like, you know, God has a way of just bringing people into your life. Um, you know, and even in my, like Jess, her mother came to my house in New Orleans. We had gumbo together. Like the fact that like you actually wanted to break in real bread with people in like a, in a, uh, the people that are meant to stay in your life, you know? So, um, yeah, I think like you just can't find, it's going to find, it'll find you. The people will find you. Everything will find you. Yeah. And like she said, I just wanted to piggyback off of that just to say, um, is the saying that my boy JB put me up on. He said, he said, don't let your imagination get in the way of God's manifestation. Mm. And when he said that, I'm like, yo, that's so real. Cause you see something, a certain way and then when you when you finally get what you what you thought you want it's even better when you when you just let let it flow when you just let it go they say let go and let god and and that makes it so much better man plan and god laughs that's what they say as well <laughs> I, I will jump off of that really quick to say that when audrey and i met i was acting full-time and I had asked my manager to set me up on some meetings with producers because I was, long story, not totally happy with the kind of content that was being made, uh, at a, at a, even at a high level. Um, and so basically I was, you know, I was looking for maybe a mentor, maybe somebody to sort of teach me to let me follow them around a little bit. I was like 24 at the time, Audrey, or something crazy like that. And so, um, 
you know, we sat down for lunch and it was like kindred spirits immediately. I didn't even, I wasn't looking for a partner. I wasn't looking for a business partner, for a producing partner, anything like that. I, I didn't know. I just walked in with an open heart and said, I think it's important to start making things that I care about. Um, and it mattered to the world. And, and we just like clicked on that immediately, man. And it was, I think less than a year before we were both sitting down and saying like, all right, we got to build something together. This is about making, making a home and building a space and, and really doing that. And it's exactly what y'all said. It's like, I couldn't have planned it. I couldn't have said this thing was going to lead to this thing was going to lead to this was going to lead to, to Audrey. And it's been just like such a blessing. Um, yeah. And, and, and more than what I could have even imagined. So. I, I want to add something just because I know your question was also based on like what people can think about when they're looking for partnership or that. And I think um, self-awareness is huge. I mean, I think knowing that you have a psychology being in a human body that you've been through things like all human beings, but that they get in your way that you tell stories about what's happening that you, you have belief systems that are in your way and getting more and more aware of what those things are that stop you from being the beautiful being that you are and the energy that you are that's positive that can attract people like Jess, can attract people like Kudi and Chike and you, Zandashi, like that, that's what life is about. It's your energy, it's what, you, it's what you put out into the world is what you get back. You love yourself, you're gonna get love from the universe. It's pretty, it's pretty simple stuff, not so simple to unravel. <laughs> so I think my, my biggest thing to say is like, Jess and I are different generations. It is the biggest gift. I can't tell you how many people I watch be ageist. You know, don't be an ageist. Like she has contributed tremendously to my life. It do, I'm not better because I'm older. I do think women are like fine wine. I did have a birthday yesterday, <laughs> but, but I, it's not, I'm, I'm joking, but I do think you have to be open-minded. I think you have to stop creating walls and barriers between people. I think you have to be surprised by what shows up as, as your partner and, and how that might change the world. And, and I don't mean to be cheesy about it, but storytelling makes an impact. It, it's forever and it can, it can, even if you reach one person, it's worth it. And, and I think that the clearer you can get as an individual, the more the gifts will show up. And that's our job, you know? We, we have to deal with ourselves and our psychology and not look for the love all the time externally because it's got to start with you. Um, and I will say, I mean, it's just been a total blessing starting Invisible with Jess. And the other thing I would say is values. You yeah. know, who, who are you and what do you care about? And, and how willing are you, how far are you willing to go to create systemic change if that's what you're up to or, or, to, or to rock the boat or to talk truth when it's difficult? to put yourself in a tough position and not be afraid to, to deal with whatever might come, not be afraid of conflict. So, you know, peaceful warrior, that's what I would say. And then you find your people, they, they and, come to you. And I think like to the question before about Kudi and Chika and how they work together, like finding the, you know, like know what your strengths are, know what you bring to the table and then also know what you don't like and, and, and build coalitions around that. Say like, how can we sort of bring our gifts and combine our gifts with the gifts of other people in order to create something that is whole and complete because no one of us is an island. Mm -hmm. so that's the other thing that I would say. I think that's valuable lifelong work that, you know, that's, that's a question that we're constantly trying to answer. Um, so I, I love that. I love that in regards to collaboration. Um, we have one more question from Tracy Comfort. And Tracy was in our 2019 Southern Producers Lab. So hi, Tracy. Yes. Thank you for participating. Um, do you heavily storyboard and do a series Bible for the show? Or is it different for an anthology series? What does that look like? That's a great question. Yeah, it's, it's, it's to answer both. It's both. So we definitely heavily storyboard um all these episodes were i mean painstakingly just to tell you I, get meticulous like this was part of our story before. and i was had to cut out every single one of those pictures too and, <laughs> but uh we heavily story we heavily storyboard and just on the uh, um i'm gonna see if i can if i can do this without um Okay, no, I was gonna. We did. We had to do a, a deck, not really like a series, a, a a Bible, 
Well, yeah, I guess it was a it was a Bible because we thoroughly had to show showcase every episode in depth, beat by beat, what we were going for, like all the references. Our 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 deck was it was intense for this, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I get PTSD actually, kind of thinking about, <laughs> about it. <laughs> but uh, but that's part of the process. I mean, you know, you can't leave it. You can't leave any room for anybody to reinterpret what your vision is to the best of your capabilities. So you have to be very detailed and meticulous about expressing your your um, the story that you want to get across. But then at the same token, you can't get married to it either. So no matter how much you storyboard, no matter how much you put this Bible together, um, down to the shooting day, you have to be prepared to be malleable because anything can, can happen. And as a, as a director, like Kudi and I, we have to be malleable enough to quickly think on our feet and be okay with another creative solution that we could have never even planned to have to even make. So you have to be ready for that. So you, you know, you always, you can't get stuck and married to anything. Everything can be cut at any given second, even down that, not even a shooting day. Once you get to post, you can't care. You can't even get married to any scene at all, oh. you know, and it might not be up to you. You might love something, but if the studio wants to cut it at the end of the day, they pay for it. Like it, it you can fight for it, but then you got to choose what you want to fight for. Sometimes you have to sacrifice something to get two other things. So. But it always work out. Whatever. Mm-hmm. It always work out. And, and Tracy, I think as speaking as a producer, you know, it's also about responding to the needs of your, of your directors as far as the storyboarding. And I think for, for Kudi and Chike, who are super visual and who are super specific, it also was a really helpful tool when we were talking to the different departments to say like, this is what it's gonna look like. These are the kinds of like camera angles that they're looking for. It was really helpful to work with Josh, our cinematographer. It was really helpful to work with the art department. Just be like, this is the kind of vibe. This is the style that we're going for. So it was just a really helpful tool also to communicate. And then as first time uh, narrative directors, just to be able to also have those conversations between the four of us to say like, okay, great. Well, if you want that many angles, it's this many setups, which means we need this much more time. Is there a way that we could cut that down so that it works with our schedule better, et cetera. So it just, it created communication that was really helpful. Um, That, you know, some directors might not need that, but it was really a tool that we were able to use here. That's great. Um, well, we are almost out of time, so I'm going to start wrapping things up, but uh, before we close out, I want to let everyone know that you can use promo code NOFS2020 to get a one-month free trial at Topic, so go run and do that, go check out the third episode, um, and yeah, to close things out, I mean, what, what can we look forward to from all of you? Well, definitely, hope, hopefully a re-up of uh, this episode of Soul City uh, season where we can really like explore and really dig in and really bring these uh, to life to where we want to. I think that'll be the best blessing that we could ever receive based off of creating these. Um, but respectively, I mean, we have other other docs that we're currently working on, other scripted projects that we're developing. Um, definitely look forward to you know collectively us all together as as a group as invisible and creative control we have projects in the works that we're working on so um, it was just a be- it was the very beginning of a very fruitful relationship um, and I, and I think it's obviously like being able to shoot some stuff in New Orleans you know the talent that we've been able to meet in New Orleans being able to uh, shoot projects with a lot of the same actors and crew um, that we worked with and met on this project would be amazing so. Mm-hmm. Our our first um, feature it was released May first on VOD. It's called Bull uh, by Annie Silverstein. It stars Rob Morgan and Amber Havard, and it's uh, it went to Cannes Film Festival and uh, won an award at South by Southwest and a bunch of awards at Deville. Um, and it's uh, it's it's uh, authentic storytelling in a very unusual mm-hmm. way. So definitely worth checking out. Um, we have a film in post in LA right now. We have a doc with these guys, another doc in post, um, the incredible Sandy Dabowski's doc. He's been working on it for, is it 16 years, Jess? I think at this point now, 16. Yeah. Um, and we have a huge slate of projects on both Creative Control and Invisible that were, you know, like you do in different 
um, in various degrees of ready development, financing, getting, putting it together. Obviously COVID has created an interesting moment for all of us to reflect and mm -hmm. see where this is all going to go. Um, and we're just, so, we would love to do more, you know, Soul City. So, mm -hmm. so we're, we're going to hopefully be chatting about that, but we'll do anything with these guys. True that. Yeah. Tell your friends to watch Soul City. The more yeah. I've applied, the more likely we are to get another season. So shout it out. Um, and then let's show, them, let's, show them, let's show them that New Orleans wants it. Because if, if yeah. New Orleans shows a presence, then at least they know they got a market alone in New Orleans. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think they definitely do. I would love to see more. When you support a film, it's like casting a vote for what you want to see more of. So Yes, everyone, please encourage everyone you know to watch the series and support these filmmakers. And my bad, Jess, I had cut you off. I'm sorry. Was, no, yeah. you could. <laughs> no, I was just going to say that to follow any of our work, we're on Twitter and Instagram at invisible underscore pics, P-I-C-S. And then y'all should shout out your the spaces where they can follow you guys, too. Please. Cool, cootie Rock for me. Cootie, C-O-O-D-I-E-R-O-C-K. Instagram and official Cootie and Chike is our um, together Instagram and Chike. Yeah, on Instagram, you can follow me at Koza, C-O-Z-A-H. Great. And I am on Instagram and Twitter, just plain old Zandache. Mm -hmm. It's a very unique name that no one else had. <laughs> it's not plain, neither. So. <laughs> yeah, not plain. <laughs> So thank you all so much. I super enjoyed this. I could keep talking for, for hours, um, but I will stay tuned for your work and hopefully we can have those conversations in the future. Yes, thank you. Right. Thank you. Right. Thanks thank everybody. Everybody, everybody that's tuning in. Thank y'all. Thank you all thank so you. much. Take care of yourselves. Thank you. Peace and blessings.